The theme of our current teaching series is Jesus is Better, which in a nutshell sums up the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is one of the deepest theological books in all of the Bible, but especially in the New Testament. And because it's so theologically deep, and because it's so theologically rich, it's harder to understand than a lot of other books of the Bible, and that's why we're taking our time through it. That's why we're taking a longer look at the book of Hebrews, so that as we go deeper into the contents of Hebrews, the truth of its contents will go deeper into us. All right, that's what we're trying to do. And it requires, as we looked at a couple weeks ago, it really requires some mental effort to work our way through. We've got to exercise our brains. We, we've got a desire to understand what it's trying to say. And two weeks ago, we started to look at this sudden break that the author makes in the regular flow of his argument at the end of chapter five and into the beginning of chapter six. Last week, Joe preached on the second half of that break. So there's, there's this break and, and he finishes off the this, the second half of the break by basically saying Jesus is the better hope that we have. He's, he's made these tremendous promises to us and we can trust him. And two weeks ago I mentioned that today I was gonna tell you who Melchizedek was. And I know that some of you have just been chomping at the bit for me to preach this sermon. I know, I know. Some of you sped on the way here this morning. That's how anxious you were to hear this sermon. And I'm going to make good on my word. I'm going to tell you who Melchizedek is. So let's get right into the passage because it is a fairly lengthy passage. We're going to read the whole chapter of chapter 7. And I'm going to invite you to stand. Hebrews 7, the scripture reading will be on, uh, on the screen. And you can follow along there. It is also on your handout. Hebrews chapter 7. Here we go. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also, king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their fellow Israelites, even though they also are descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, but he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In the one case, the tenth is collected by people who die, but in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collected the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect. 
And a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath, but he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. And this is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now. Thank you for this word. Lord, there is so much for us to take in here, so much we can learn. May our hearts truly be open, not just to understanding, but to responding. Holy Spirit, guide us into what is real and true. And may the truth set us free. We thank you in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, now, in this passage, the author teaches us about the mysterious Melchizedek, the ineffective priesthood, the greater priest king, and what it all means. All right? The mysterious Melchizedek, the ineffective priesthood, the greater priest king, and finally, what it all means. So let's talk about, to start, the mysterious Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek is central in the thought of the book of Hebrews. But here's the amazing thing. No other New Testament book talks about him. Paul doesn't mention him. James and John don't mention him. None of the Gospels mention him. Nobody else mentions Melchizedek, only the author of Hebrews. And in fact, the only place you'll read about Melchizedek are two places in the Old Testament, Genesis 14 and Psalm 110. And we read from both of them this morning. Those are the only references. He's this obscure character who shows up out of the blue in the story of Abraham for three verses, and then he simply disappears from the story again altogether. He's there, and then he vanishes and Genesis gives no origin story of who this guy is, which is very odd, by the way, for a book that's full of origin stories. I mean, everybody in Genesis has got a genealogy. Everybody. Abraham's got a genealogy. Adam's got a genealogy. Noah's got it. Everybody's got a genealogy. Melchizedek, there's no origin story. Who is this guy? Now, Genesis 14 that we, uh, Joe read for us this morning gives the account of four Canaanite kings who went to war with five other Canaanite kings and they defeated those kings and in the process they carried off Abraham's nephew Lot who was living in Sodom at the time and they carried off his whole household with him and all of his possessions. Abraham receives word from a messenger that his, his nephew Lot has been taken captive and so he goes on a rescue mission. So he gets his household together and they march out and they ambush the camps of these other kings and they take back Lot and his household and all the possessions. And right after that, on the journey home, Abraham encounters Melchizedek. He brings out bread and wine for Abraham, which is, sounds very interestingly sacramental, by the way, if you didn't catch that. And 
Then he pronounces a blessing over Abraham, and in response, Abraham tithes a tenth of the war plunder to Melchizedek. The end. That's the story. And most of us are left going, huh? (laughs) There's no other mention of Melchizedek in in the Old Testament except this strange little verse that pops up in Psalm 110, verse four. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And if you haven't noticed it um, as we've been going along, or maybe if you've been reading Hebrews along with this series, this is like the third or fourth time this verse has popped up in Hebrews. This verse keeps popping up. Why is the author of Hebrews so fascinated by Melchizedek? And the answer is this. He saw something. He saw something in Genesis 14, verses 18 to 20, those three verses, and he saw something in Psalm 110, verse four, that is absolutely crucial to the Christian life. He saw something. The Spirit of God showed him something, and he grabbed hold of that, that he made sure that he wrote it down, and he wrote it down in a letter to a group of Jewish Christians who were struggling in their faith, and it's been preserved for you and I today as part of God's word. And therefore, what that means is this. If we don't understand who Melchizedek is, we're gonna miss something about Jesus. If we don't understand who Melchizedek is, we're gonna miss something deeply important about who Jesus is. So let's just look at four quick details that Genesis 14 gives us and Hebrews 7 echoes about Melchizedek. First of all, Melchizedek was a king. He was the king of Salem, but his name also meant uh, king of righteousness. So he was the king of Salem, but his name, Melchizedek, meant king of righteousness. And here's what the author of Hebrews is saying. He's saying there's a double emphasis on the royalty here. There's double royalty going on. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness, then also king of Salem means king of peace. He was royalty of a special kind. There's a double emphasis on his royalty. But secondly, Melchizedek was not just a king, Melchizedek was a priest. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. Now, the story... This is so interesting, and here's why. Kings were never priests, and priests were never kings. Kings were never priests, and priests were never kings. They were separate roles. They were were different individuals, but Melchizedek is a king who the story says was priest of God Most High. The story doesn't tell us anything about how he became a king or how he was appointed priest, Just that he was both a king and a priest. Very, very unusual. Third detail. Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Now there are two very shocking details in this story. The first one is that Melchizedek blessed Abraham. This this is totally shocking and here's why. Here's Abraham, the one who in Genesis 12 has received the amazing promise of God, the amazing covenant of God. I mean, he's been promised that his family is gonna grow into this great nation and that God is gonna use them to bless the world. And and God says, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you and I'm gonna give you this, this country and this land to live in. I mean, there was all these promises. But in this story, the one who has the blessing is receiving a blessing from another person. I mean, this is so odd. In Hebrews, he he picks up on this, the author. He says in verse seven, the lesser is always blessed by the greater. So if Abraham, the one who has the promises, is receiving a blessing from Melchizedek, then Melchizedek is clearly greater than Abraham. So bizarre. (laughs) Uh, there's that verse there. But here's the fourth detail that's shocking. Melchizedek received a tithe from Abraham. 
Now, you and I are not shocked by this. We're saying, "Uh uh-huh. But let me tell you something. This would have absolutely shocked a Jewish reader. Anybody from a Jewish background would be shocked by this, and here's why. In the law, the priests who were descendants of Levi, they were the descendants of Aaron, um, Moses' brother, that tribe was specifically designated to be the priests for the people, to represent the people. And when the promised land was, was divided up, when the, the Israelites finally went into the promised land and, and took over and, and came into the land God promised them, the land got divvied up. Every tribe got a piece of the land except the tribe of Levi. Because they were the priests, their job was to be in the temple all the time. They, were, they constantly had work to do in the temple. So, therefore, because they had no land, because they weren't going to have time to work the land, because they had no land, God made a provision for them in the law so that they could have um, financial support. And that was that all the other tribes would tithe uh, a 10%, 10% of their income to the temple so that the priests could have an income. Now, the author of Hebrews points out something very interesting when he says that Melchizedek did not trace his descent from Levi. I think I got this verse. Yet he collected a tenth from Abraham. And one might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. Here's what the author of Hebrews is saying. There's, there's no priesthood yet, all right? Chronologically in the story, there's no priesthood yet. And that, but looking ahead at what God was gonna do when he established the priesthood, and yet Melchizedek, he's not related to Abraham as far as we know. And, and Abraham's the one through whom the nation's gonna come. He's the one through whom the 12 tribes are gonna come, and yet he's receiving a tithe from Abraham. Somehow, Melchizedek has a priesthood superior to the Levitical priesthood that's coming in the law. Somehow, his priesthood places him in a position to receive a tithe from Abraham. Very bizarre. Now, before we can go any further, we've got to talk about this concept of priesthood. We need to understand this. The book of Hebrews was written as an answer to this question, how can we have access to God? How can we have access to God? That's what the book seeks to answer. And this is the age old question that religion has always tried to answer. And in the Old Testament, the answer is found in the Levitical priesthood and the sacrificial system. That's the way that you had access to God. You had to go to the tabernacle. But here was the problem. The tabernacle, as much as it was the place where God dwelt, it was a constant and clear reminder that sin left people separated from God. Sin left people separated. Because of sin, God had to limit his presence to a certain space within the tabernacle so that he could dwell amongst his people and be close to them, but not consume him like them with the, the fullness of his glory. So he's got to confine, you know, God limits himself to this, this one space. And sin offerings had to be made by the people. And that's how sins were forgiven. You made the sin offerings, and the priests were the representatives of the, of the people before God, and simply put, the job of the priests was to do all the work that was required to forgive sins. The priests did all the work. The people brought the sacrifices, but the priests offered the sacrifices. The, the people brought um, the animal, but the priest had to, uh, had, to, had to sacrifice the animal. They had to offer the blood. They had to clean up the blood. They had to keep the lamps lit. They had to keep the incense burning. They had, to, they had to keep the bread fresh on the table in the tabernacle. The priest did all the work on behalf of the people, and that's why God devotes an entire tribe to this job and says the job of just this one tribe is to do all this work. 
But after all the work of the priests, after all the sacrifices were offered, after the great day of atonement, when the high priest went in that one time a year to offer the, the sacrifice on behalf of all the people's sins, the veil was still there. The curtain separating people from the presence of God was still hanging there. The separation between the people and God remained. They didn't have access. What the author of Hebrews recognizes is that the Levitical priesthood and the sacrificial system was not giving true access to God. It, in a nutshell, the priesthood was ineffective. It wasn't working. It was the system that was in place, but Nobody was ever drawing close to God. They couldn't. The curtain's still there. No amount of sacrifices changed anything, as it were. Why? I mean, this, the, the system that was established to achieve access to God was not working. Why? And the answer is because every priest was also a sinner. Every priest was also a sinner. And therefore, every priest was a weak, imperfect representative before God. The author of Hebrews um, says, for the law appoints as high priests all, sorry, men in all their weakness. As the author of Hebrews also points out, these priests keep dying. Did you catch that? They, they, just, they keep dying. Now there have been many of those priests, verse 23, since death prevented them from continuing in office. In other words, he says the priests keep dying off, new priests keep replacing them. Sure, they're all descendants from the tribe of Levi, but they just keep dying. And when they die, new ones replace them. And they start all over again, and we offer all the sacrifices, and they die, new priests replace them. Priests would come and go. Sacrifices were offered on the people's behalf, but the curtain remains. What's needed is a better priesthood. A better priesthood is required. A permanent priesthood. And that's exactly what Psalm 110, verse 4, pointed to. Verse 11 of Hebrews 7 says, If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. Here's what's going on. In Psalm 110, verse 4, the psalmist is writing about the Messiah. He's writing about the the king who is to come. But he's also writing about the one who would finally give the people true access, true access to God's presence. Now, here's what's amazing. The Messiah was a king. Everything associated with the Messiah in the Jewish thinking was, was kingship. You know, the, the Messiah was a king who was going to come and establish God's kingdom on earth and he was going to bring an, a new administration over all of creation and he would make things right and, and God's justice, he would bring God's justice on the world and, and make all wrongs right. But what Psalm 110.4 gives us more than any other verse in the Old Testament, I believe, anyway, is this, and I think this is what the author of Hebrews caught. He says that in the Messiah, we not only get a king, but a priest. Not only a king, but a priest. And that's why, here it is, here it is, folks. You drove all the way here for this this morning, all right? Don't miss it. That's why Melchizedek, the great priest king, is so important so the, the author of Hebrews and so important to you and I to understanding who Jesus is. So let's talk about now the greater king priest. Jesus, our greater priest king, is able to do what no other priest could ever do. And that's give us access to God. And he gives us the access for two reasons. First of all, 
He gives us access because of who he is. Now, you'll notice that the author of Hebrews sees these striking similarities between Melchizedek and Jesus. He says in verse 3, without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Now, first of all, the author points out that Melchizedek is this, strangely, he's this eternal figure. There was this practice of interpretation in, uh, in Jewish readings of the text that, that what the text doesn't say has as much weight as what the text does say. And so here's what the author of Hebrews does. He looks at this and says, there's no mention of where Melchizedek comes from. There's no genealogy. Ah, strange, we talked about that. No genealogy. Whereas everybody else in Genesis has got a genealogy. Melchizedek doesn't. No mention of where he came from. No mention of his, of his death. No mention of father or mother. No mention of any kind of end to his priesthood. Now here's the thing. Is the author of Hebrews trying to say, oh, Melchizedek never died? That he existed before anything else? No, but here's what he's doing. He's saying Melchizedek resembles Jesus. He resembles Jesus in this way. Now, some of you are thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus have a mother? Didn't, doesn't Jesus have a genealogy? Didn't Matthew go out of his way at the beginning of his gospel to lay out this genealogy? The answer, of course, is yes, but you're missing the point. The point of the author of Hebrews is this. Like Melchizedek, Jesus has a unique origin a unique origin, an origin that had established him as a different kind of priest and therefore means that what he brings is a different priesthood. Jesus' priesthood, like Melchizedek, was based on his personal worth and his character, not his ancestry. Priests were from the tribe of Levi, but Jesus, the author plainly says, he says he's from the tribe of Judah, Who of these things, I I don't have this verse, but listen, verse 13 and 14. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and in that regard, uh, sorry, in regard to that, Moses said nothing about priests. If Jesus is not from the tribe of Levi, it means that when he comes, he comes with a better priesthood. One who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. See, if you were born in the tribe of Levi, you know what that meant? You were destined to be a priest. And here, don't miss it. It didn't matter what kind of person you were. If you were born in the tribe of Levi, you were a priest. That was going to be your life. But see, Jesus doesn't come from the tribe of Levi. His priesthood is not about his ancestry. That's his kingship. That's another topic. That's another sermon. His priesthood is established based on who he is, on the power of an indestructible life. And this is a reference, of course, to the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus was raised from the dead, and Unlike the other priesthood, that means that Jesus doesn't die, not in the same way. He's forever. He, and he's, his, his priesthood is permanent. It's eternal. He doesn't die like the other priests do. He comes back. <laughs> None of them come back. Jesus comes back, and therefore he is able to save, the author of Hebrews says, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Because at this moment, Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of the Father and his job is to constantly point at his finished work for you and I. He points the Father to that and says, Father, it's done. They have access because of what I did. That's why in the previous chapters, the the author is able to say, come boldly to the throne of grace. We can come boldly in because of what our great high priest has done. What Jesus offers to God is a perfect life. 
a perfect life. And the only way Jesus could live forever, that, that's the only way he could live is if he lived without sin. As Paul reminds us in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin, it's death. But here's one who doesn't die. Here's one who comes back. Here's one who's triumphed over death. Why? Because he lived a sinless life. And because he lives forever, unlike all the other priests before who lived and died, he's able to intercede. He's able to stand in the gap. He's the only one qualified to give us access. So Jesus gives us access to God because of who he is. But secondly, he gives us access because of who, of, that should say, of what he's done. I'm sorry. I did not change that last piece. Jesus gives us access to God because of what he's done. His origin is unique, but his priestly work is also unique. And here's why. Every priest, we just talked about it, every priest was a sinner, just like everybody that they represented. And therefore, before they could offer any kinds of sacrifices for the people, here's what they had to do. The priests, they had to, they had to clean themselves and they had to offer sacrifices for themselves. They had to take the first step to make sure that everything between them and God was, was okay before they could offer anything on behalf of the people. And if you look at the regulations for the Day of Atonement, oh my goodness, all the things the high priest had to do and the things he had to, to go through as far as the cleansing rituals and everything, right down to the kind of underwear he had to wear. Man, I'm glad I don't have to do that. Could you imagine that? Sunday morning, Jocelyn, where's my preaching underwear? <laughs> but they, they, had, they had right down to their undergarments, they had specific clothes they had, they had to wear. Everything was regulated. But here's Jesus, who lives a perfect life. There's no sins of his own to purify himself as. Uh, of, and this is what makes his work as a priest so unique. Whereas every other priest was sinful, every other priest was weak, Jesus was pure, Jesus was sinless, and he was able to come and offer a true, pure sacrifice. And here's what the author of Hebrews says. Such a high priest truly meets our need. What do we need? This is what we need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. And unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Friends, Jesus Christ, the true king of righteousness, the true king of peace, the true Melchizedek, looks down from heaven, and what does he see? He sees that our sin, your sin, my sin, is keeping us from his presence, keeping us from truly delighting in him, keeping us from truly living in him, keeping us from the true joy and love and hope that's found in him, and here's what he does. He comes down, and he becomes a priest, and he offers the ultimate sacrifice for his sins. He didn't just offer a sacrifice, he became the sacrifice. What he offers is himself. So pure, so perfect, so complete that it never needs to be offered again. We're gonna talk about that when we come back to Hebrews in the new year. When he died on the cross, it says the veil was torn. That constant reminder to the people every time they went to the tabernacle to sacrifice, that God was still off limits. You, you couldn't get access. The curtain is torn open. And three days later, he's raised from the dead, and he ascends to heaven, and now he intercedes for us. See, in Jesus, we finally have the priest that we need. But you see, he is the priest. He is the ultimate priest because of who he is. So, let's get down to brass tacks here. What does this all mean? What does this all mean? It means, first of all, this. Jesus is a priest who is a king. 
That's the implication. Now let's work out the application. You know, one of the dangers that you and I fall prey to in the Christian life is that we forget that Jesus is not only our priest, but he's Lord. He's king. He's not just savior. He's Lord. See, we often want the forgiveness of Jesus. You know, we like that part, the part about, you know, having our guilt and our shame taken away. We like this whole idea of, uh, you know, avoiding hell. (laughs) Yeah, give me some of that. I'm all for that. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Usually we like that. People like the sound of that. But we forget We forget that Jesus isn't just Savior, he's Lord. In other words, we want the forgiveness of Jesus, but we don't want to obey Jesus. We forget that Jesus is not only priest of God most high, he is God most high. And that means that he has authority over your life and authority over my life just because of who he is, because of what he's done. And he deserves yours and mine Complete devotion. Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe because of who he was. But Jesus is the greater Melchizedek who doesn't, who's not just entitled to a tithe, by the way, he's entitled to everything. He has this status, king of kings and lord of lords, creator of the universe, sustainer of all things. Now I want to press this for a moment because I really felt it strong on my heart. I want to press this. Some of you are not tithing regularly or you're struggling to tithe. And the reason for this may be that you're not faithfully managing your money as a whole. You might be spending too much money on yourself. You're spending too much money on your hobbies. You're spending too much money on fixing your house. You're spending too much money on on decorating your house. You're spending too much money on your car. You're spending too much money on eating out. You're spending too much money on your kids, maybe. And your spending habits are putting you in a position financially where at the end of the day you say, I can't afford to tithe. Or what you're really saying is, I don't want to sacrifice something in my lifestyle so that I am able to tithe. But here's the thing. See, Jesus doesn't just care about what you do with a tenth of your income. This is, the, this is the greatest myth of the church, by the way, is that we just, you know, I put my 10% in the plate, I'm good. No, you're not. Here's why. Because Jesus cares about what you do with all of it, how you manage all of it. And it's not, and it's not just about giving to the church. It's, it's about being generous with your money in everyday life with people you meet who are in need. But if you're always spending on yourself, if you're always spending on things of your own interest, you don't have anything to give away. Is Jesus Christ Lord of your bank account? Is he Lord of your checkbook? Is he Lord of uh, your credit card? Is he Lord of your investment portfolio, your RSP? Do you see where I'm going with this? For some of you, the issue isn't money, but time. Your money isn't as precious to you maybe as your time is. It may be that you're spending too much much time on your hobbies or too much time on family activities. Now, I know that sounds bizarre, and don't misunderstand me. Your family is your first ministry priority, but it is not your only ministry priority, okay? Your family is your first ministry priority, but it is not your only ministry ministry priority. Scripture is very clear about that, about what it means to be part of the church. It may be that you're neglecting spending time with your, your church family or neglecting serving your church family because you'd rather do other things. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but we're a small group of people. And because we're a small group of people, there's only so much we can do. But I can tell you what, we can do a lot more when all hands are on board. As, the, as uh, Solomon said, many hands make light work. It's about, and it's not just about the church. I'm not just talking about giving your time to serve in the church. It's about your everyday life. Do you have time for people? Do you have time to serve them? Is Jesus Lord of your schedule? Is he Lord of your calendar? And still others of you, maybe the issue isn't time or money, but it's your gifts and talents. 
It may be that you have certain abilities, you have certain gifts that you only offer when you're being compensated for them with either money or favors. I'll do this that I'm good at if I get compensated for it, if I get a favor out of it. In other words, your motivation really isn't to help, it's just to get something. It may be that you have talents that you use in your workplace that you're not willing to use in the church. You, you may see a need in the church that you could meet, but you don't really want to offer your gifts to meet it. And by the way, it's not just about giving to the church. Again, it's about in your everyday life. In your everyday life, are you being generous with the gifts that God's given you, with the abilities he's given you? In other words, this question, is, God, is Jesus Christ Lord of your skill set? Or do you just use the skills he gave you for your own gain. For most of us, it tends to be a combination between those things, money, time, gifts. But the question is, are you just using Jesus to get salvation? I'm talking to those of you who really say you're Christians today. Are you just using Jesus to get salvation, or is he Lord of your life? Is he just your priest? Or is he truly Melchizedek in your life? Is he the true priest king in your life? That's the first thing. Jesus is a priest who's a king. Oh, sorry, I forgot to throw those up there. You have them on your handout, though. Last thing. Jesus isn't just a priest who's a king. He's a king who's a priest. And here's why that's important. It's not just to play on words. Some of you here this morning have yet to receive Jesus Christ as your savior. Maybe you've been saying, you know, Pastor Mark, you know, I'm just kind of kind of on that line. You know, maybe part of me would like to become a Christian, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure where I sit. You're, it may be that you're holding back from becoming a Christian because you're afraid of everything you're going to lose. You're afraid of everything you're going to lose. You're afraid of losing control over your life. You're 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 afraid of losing control over the things we just talked about: your money, your time, your your energy, your gifts. And when you look at God, all you see is a king who's making demands on your life. And you feel, you just feel like you don't, don't want to submit to that because all, all God is to you is a king. And what you need to see this morning is you need to see the priestly work of Jesus Christ. That he is not just a king, but he's a priest. You need to see what he did for you and how it saves you completely. You, You have to see the position of favor and blessing that he's put you in because of what he's done. What you need to see is what it cost him to speak words of blessing over you like Melchizedek did over Abraham. It cost Jesus something. The only way that Jesus Christ could speak blessings over you and I is if he took the curse that was upon us. And that's exactly what he did. In Deuteronomy it says, cursed is anyone who's hung on a tree. Cursed is anyone, and that's why as Jesus Christ hung on the cross, the people mocked him and they disdained him and they, they, they spoke nasty words at him because they basically said, there's the proof. There's the proof he's not from God. He's cursed. Yes, he was cursed, but not because of his sins. On the cross, Jesus Christ took the curse of our sins so that we could have the words of blessing spoken over us. That's what he did. Do you see what this king did? God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. The king of righteousness became sin that we would become righteous. He surrendered. Friends, I can't can't emphasize this enough. Jesus Christ surrendered for us long before he asked us to surrender to him. He's already done the surrender part. The king has come and surrendered, offered himself. He's not only a king, he's a priest. He's a priest who served you and served me by going to the cross. He's already surrendered. And he's asking now, will you surrender, when you surrender to me? Is Jesus Christ your king? Is Jesus Christ your priest? He's the better Melchizedek. Jesus said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many.
Let's pray. Lord, this is a deep passage of scripture proclaiming all kinds of things to us this morning. And these questions loom heavy over us. Are you just a priest to us, Jesus, or are you king? And do we have a distorted view that you're just a king and not a priest who has come to serve us and free us? Lord God, for those of us here who are feeling the weight of this passage this morning, may we not be motivated in our guilt today or by fear, but by love for Jesus Christ, who in love for us came and gave himself. What a king, what a priest. May we come to understand him in this way more deeply and may we indeed seek to serve you in every area of, your li- of our lives. Lord, we give you our money. We give you our time. We give you our gifts. We surrender these things to you. Help us to reshape the way we live around the great generosity of your son so that we might be generous in all things and in all ways. We thank you in his precious name. Amen.